All right, everyone, we are back on the How I Sell podcast presented by Ramp. Today, I'm here with a special guest. It's Josh Roth. Josh is a senior director of inside sales over at Lob. He has spent a ton of time in tech, moving up the ranks and holding leadership positions at WalkMe and CarePoint. Before that, he delved into sports and worked in sports, and he's an avid Oregon Duck fan, and we're catching him at a good time because the Oregon Ducks just beat Ohio State, and as a Michigan fan, I'm thrilled about that. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Danny. Super pumped, and uh, you you couldn't have said it better. Uh, go Ducks. Great week to be on a podcast. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Pumped to have you. As a reminder for our audience In season two of How I Sell, we're asking all of our guests the same five questions to get that apples to apples comparison across many sales leaders throughout the country. Before we jump into the question, Josh, I want to ask you, who is Josh Roth? Uh, So, you know, I think the best way that I like to describe myself is an empathetic sales leader um, that really invests in growing the team. Um, and you know, if you look on, on LinkedIn, you know, my, my header is I lead sales teams in SaaS to hit and exceed quotas. I actually think that I would slightly change that, um, to be, I lead a team of, um, diverse salespeople to hit and exceed sales quotas. That's awesome. Love hearing it. We've heard empathetic quite a bit on this podcast, and I think it's not just a theme anymore. It's something that you really have to do in order to surpass, uh, folks who are kind of left behind in that old school you know, bash your skull in type of sales. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that and also would love to touch on it later in the pod as well. If you're ready, though, want to jump into the five questions that we have for all of our guests. Let's do it. All right. Awesome. So question number one, what is the best investment an early career salesperson can do for themselves and why? Oh, that's a great one. I'm going to, I think that listening and reading are the best two investments you can make early in your sales career. Um, listening to your peers, your colleagues, and your leaders and managers that have been there, um, and reading. Read to learn, read to understand, read for comprehension on really anything from skill development to methodology, um, all the way down to experience. You know, you you don't have to pick up a book from uh, Mark Benioff, although if you do, I highly recommend Trailblazer because it's an incredible book. But really, you know, there's a lot of great books out there. If you check out um, Scott Lees, he's got a bunch of good books. You know, picking up really anything from someone that's been there and had experience is better than not doing anything at all. Yeah, it's great advice. And something we've heard a couple of times over too is reading something that came naturally to you. Do you have to learn it? And for folks out there that maybe aren't accustomed to reading, someone like me who didn't get into reading until a few years back, how do you how do you recommend they jump into it? Because it, you know, and the thought of reading for some is just so hard to overcome, right? It's boring potentially. Pick up a book, you got your screens in front of you. You know, what 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 do you need to do to just get started? Yeah, you know, I always recommend reading something that that interests you at first to just kind of like start recognizing what the process is, right? You know, I think a lot of people will say, um, you know, I set a goal of reading 50 pages a day and that's awesome, right? Any reading that you do is great. But for me, if I'm reading just to hit a goal of 50 pages, I I would question the comprehension of it. You know, I want to read something I'm really interested in. So when I started reading, it was about uh, 10 years ago when I started reading much more diligently. Uh, I went to the the duck store um, in Eugene, Oregon, and I pulled two books off the shelf that uh, were in the New York Times bestseller list. Um, and both of which uh, I really couldn't put down. You know, it wasn't like I had to read 50 pages a day because they were both really good books. Um, one uh, is called Nemesis, a uh, really good book, really sad. Um, I didn't expect to get a sad book when I pulled it off the shelf. Uh, the other was... Um, uh, racing in the rain, which was turned into, into a movie. I think the actual title is the art of racing in the rain. Um, and again, another really sad book. I did not expect both of them to be really sad. They both were, but they were both great books. That's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, start with something you love, start with something you can get into right away. I think that's great. Just get the ball rolling. Appreciate that advice. I think it's, it's very sound. On to question number two. What's the biggest surprise you experienced early in your career and why? The biggest surprise I think is that people are watching. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, the, it's, it's not to be like a creepy big brother type of thing. 
Um, but it's more that your colleagues notice who works hard. You know, for, for years and years at the New York Mets, um, I would make the most dials. I would book the most meetings. And I never really thought anyone cared because I always felt like, oh, I'm just an ISR, right? And that's just never true. You're never just an SDR. You're never just an AE. People are always looking. They're always looking to invest in, and they recognize who does hard work. And um, I remember one, one day, you know, in the year, I think it was my third year at the Mets, um, you know, I was doing my thing. I was running around uh, during a Mets game, trying to meet with all of, of my clients that were at the game. And uh, our VP of marketing at the time um, was up on our suite level. And he had never really seen, you know, we, we'd had a couple of conversations, but it's not like he, you know, really had any business knowing who I was or, or anything like that. And I remember, you know, I was, I was kind of like doing a, a speed walk and he looks at me and said, does anyone else on the sales team besides you actually work? And you know, I was like flattered. I was like, Oh my God, like, the, like you actually noticed how hard I worked. And you know, it was, I felt like it was, it was a, a really, really big moment for my personal growth that people are noticing, you know, no one at the company, even your CEO, no one is too busy to notice. Um, and I think that the appreciation that I had for, hard work and that others actually recognizing the hard work, uh, you know, that, that was a big surprise to me. Yeah. That's, that's really great insight and something that I think young folks, especially folks entering their career, don't necessarily get the perspective of simply because, you know, you do, and I did at least, it sounds like you did too, have this mindset of like, oh, I'm just, you know, the lowest on the totem pole to kind of walk into the office and no one really cares. But it is cool, especially when you're working really hard to get noticed. And I think that is, it sounds like you had that experience. It's not always the case when you walk into an organization, but it sounds like, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where folks do notice your hard work and do notice you working hard and 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 doing well, pay attention to that feeling and try to chase that throughout the rest of your career as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Question number three, what is one mistake that you made early in your career that shaped the way you operate today? Uh, this is actually a super easy one. So I was so focused on selling net new revenue um, or, or net, net new business um, that I stopped focusing on the customer success and the customer's experience. Um, so, you know, I would sell something and then I would just stop doing anything else. You know, I would just focus on net new revenue because that was the one thing I knew would help me get promoted. I was so focused on myself and so focused on my career that I missed the most important part, which is the customer. And about two months into my sales career, um, both my manager and uh, our director kind of pulled me to the side and said, you know, look, you, you could get to the next level. You will never get to the next level if you, if you continue to lack the focus and the execution once someone becomes a customer. And they gave me a, a really good book uh, titled, uh, It's All About the Customer. Um, I read that cover to cover and I came back with really a new appreciation of customer success and, and customer service. Um, and it's it's really the, the service that I focused on was how can I be the best servicer on the team? Because that will not only lead to, to better experiences and and more revenue, but it's how I would want to be treated. And, you know, my, our, our leadership team, uh, Michelle Price and Brian Towers really kind of taught me a lesson that it's the right thing to do, right? It's not about yourself. It's not about how you're going to get to the next level. It's about doing what is right. And that really helped shape my career and, and how I've grown as not only a, a person, but as, as a professional. Um, and, I went from someone that, you know, couldn't keep an account and kept having to reassign the accounts because I, I just couldn't service them to, you know, being the, the best on the team at it. You know, they would give me all of the tough accounts because they knew I would give each and every account really, really personalized service. And I would do whatever it took to keep that account, not only year over year, but keep the people happy. And it's about forming relationships. I remember one, you know, my big turning point was after about a year after having that conversation, one of my customers uh, had had come to me and the Mets were bad. You know, we were just a bad baseball team. You could easily get tickets a lot cheaper on StubHub, on, you know, Ticketmaster. But, you know, client comes back to me and says, you know, Josh, I could probably spend half of what I spend with you, but I don't because your service and our friendship is worth 
renewing with you. And I was like, you know, that's, that's a massive turn for someone that couldn't really handle anything a year ago. And but that, that was the biggest mistake I made early in my career. You yeah. Had a lot of yeah. great ideas. These are all like really good LinkedIn posts too. Yeah. Yeah. You take it. We'll, we'll cut the, uh, we'll cut the segment up for you and you can just post the, uh, the conversation on LinkedIn too. But, but I appreciate you sharing that. You know, it's not always easy to one, to, sh- to, to receive the feedback and two, to even share about it or, or, or think about it going forward. And, you know, for folks entering the workforce, our, you know, first, second job, they don't always, often know what it's like to receive that type of critical feedback. How did it feel to get that feedback, you know, as somebody sitting in your shoes is, you know, clearly bringing in a lot of business, but again, the, the, the part that you recognize is it's not necessarily just bringing it in, it's the lifelong value of the customer and making sure they're happy over time. How did it feel in the moment to get that feedback and how did you end up deciding, you know, okay, I'm going to take this and turn it into a positive? You know, quite honestly, I just felt bad. I felt bad for the customers. It, you know, like I think about, you know, what happens if if I spent that money to, you know, bring, you know, my team or my business, uh, you know, or my friends out to a game and, and you know, I just wasn't able to get any help when I asked for it. Um, you know, I, I felt really bad. Um, and it it wasn't so much about, you know, for me, like, oh, I did, you know, I thought I did right. And now you're telling me I did wrong. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to get the coaching. Um, it was that I felt that I did the wrong thing by other people. Um, and I, I felt that, you know, I let my morals and, and values slip in exchange for, you know, my own uh, aspirations. Um, and that, that was, that, that was the hard part for me. Um, but the lesson that Brian and, and Michelle taught me is, you know, you have an opportunity to change that. You know, you have the power to change it. I did. It's awesome. One, thanks for sharing, especially the the tough stuff. And two, you know, it's it's important for folks to recognize that, you know, the way that you feel is okay, especially in a professional setting. You're you're somewhat taught either directly or indirectly coming up through the ranks or, you know, at your academic career, high school and college, that when you get into business, it's all professional mode and that's professional all the time. And you kind of act like a robot. And what I think you just revealed is, you know, um, thinking through how you're feeling and really acknowledging it in the moment does actually help you get better and helps you improve and become more of a a thoughtful um, sales executive over time or really any executive within your within your realm or any, uh, any, any professional is moving forward in their career. So it's important to acknowledge that. And I think, you know, you did a really good job of articulating what that actually means and what that, how it plays out. Question number four, who has had the greatest impact on your career, uh, and expand? Uh, the two people I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Michelle Price and Brian Towers, my, my first sales leaders, my first sales managers, um, they had the biggest impact on my career. In, in a positive way, you know, they, they were empathetic sales leaders. They always sought to understand that they, they didn't place blame. They found solutions. They taught really good lessons. You know, those were the people that I aspired to be. Um, there were quite honestly, some people that I, you know, worked for that I'm not going to call them out, but um, they were the opposite, you know, and, and, they showed me the type of leader and the type of manager that I don't want to be. And, you know, I think that you learn a lot from those people just as much as you learn from the the Brian's and Michelle's of the world, because it reminds you in the moment of who you want to be, but also who you don't want to be. Right. And it helps you think about how you want to frame that. Um, and the, the last person, um, Aaron Zakowski over at WalkMe. Um, he had a, a really instrumental impact on my career. And, and um, not only that he took a chance on me, um, you know, being a, an early stage person that had a little bit of a weirder resume, uh, you know, something he's not really going to see in late stage SAS. He took a shot on me um, and, it, you know, it, it worked out really, really well for, for all parties involved. And um, Aaron's a great mentor. He's built an incredible team at WalkMe and um, you know, if there are any, you know, SDRs or future SDRs listening to this, uh, you know, go, go check them out because, you know, I received great mentorship there, um, as a sales leader and, you know, we have, um, 
it, you know, that's something that I think looking back on, on my time at walk me, you know, Aaron will always be a, not only a, a mentor, but a friend. That's great. It sounds like you've had some really transformational folks in your career that have guided you uh, in a, a really good and right way. And I think you know, also, I, I agree, walk me, there's something special going on there. We've heard them come up a few times. Sounds like they got a great training program. So yeah, folks, you know, take Josh up on this opportunity if you ever want to connect with WalkMe because it is a great company and a public company now too. I want to talk, I want to I want to tug on the uh, the empathy thread a little bit more because that's something that I think is it's a buzzword, but it's true enough where you have to you have to embody it these days, especially in sales. What does what does an empathetic salesperson look like to you? Yeah, you know, it, I'm so glad that you called out that empathy is a is being used as a buzzword because it really is and it's it's so frustrating to me to see all these other people saying like oh like you want to be a good salesman just be empathetic like that come on like like just be empathetic like that it doesn't mean anything when you say it like that and you know to me what what being empathetic means is genuinely understanding the challenges of SDRs and BDRs, both at a professional and a personal level. And, and I want to take it a step further. Like I want to get granular because that doesn't actually mean anything anyway. Most SDR and BDR programs have monthly quotas. So you got to get X amount of opportunities each month. Well, you know what is really, really hard to do when you have a monthly quota? Take any vacation at all. Because if you take one week vacation out of the month, you got to hit your number in 75% of the time. And if you want to like, it's, that's not a fair choice for SDRs to make, right? If you're an AE, for example, right? You have a typically, not always, but typically you have a yearly quota, right? And if you hit that yearly quota, you will hit your OTE or, or accelerate on it, depending on your, your comp plan. That's not the case for SDRs and BDRs. You know, they have a yearly quota. Sure. But it's the monthly quota that is, is really looked at. And if you want to be an empathetic sales leader, give SDRs and BDRs quota relief when they go on vacation. You know, I I think it's, it's so key to understand like what that actually means. And secondly, you know, if for whatever reason, your organization does not give quota relief, which I think would, is not okay. But if your organization does not give quota relief as a manager and as a sales leader, you need to help that person set themselves up to genuinely decompress and take time off. So make sure that when you, you know, leading up to when you take vacation, you do uh, what needs to get done, prospecting, reaching after target accounts, right? Doing all of the right things the right way so that when you're back, you don't need to start from square one. You can just pick up from where you left off. And, you know, again, this is all assuming that you don't have quota relief, which you should have in the first place. But that's just one example of what you can do to be an empathetic sales leader. Um, you know, and I, I, you, you see stuff all the time from like, uh, you know, corporate bro about, um, you know, a, a thing like a BDR posted that, that, uh, you know, he proposed to his girlfriend and she, she said yes. And then the manager came through the, the Slack channel and said, Hey, you know, let's stay focused. Right. And it's just like, like, that's the type of stuff that like, Life is hard, right? Like you got to be able to celebrate the wins. And if you're not celebrating a win like that, both in your personal life and at work, like why do you work there? Like, you know, life is too short to work somewhere. It's not going to be fun. So, you know, I've always believed in, in um, something that Andrew Casey walked me CFO said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and if you really truly want to be an empathetic sales leader, you have to double down that you have to create a really strong culture around empathy, around honesty, around transparency. Yep. I I think that is all great. Thanks for expanding upon it. Uh, You know, it's not often thought through, especially on SDR teams, because sometimes you get into companies and they're looked at as, you know, kind of just numbers on a page, right? We need to hit X amount of demos. We need to hit X amount of qualified leads in order to get the sales motion started in order to, you know, hit our uh, target revenue and really like 
those numbers on the page, like that 10 or 15 or whatever your goal is, amount of demos scheduled or qualified meetings scheduled, like that's really freaking hard. It took you a hundred dials to get to one, right? Like that's, that's painful. And I think, you know, especially on the sales side, when you're a sales leader, especially when you're evaluating a company as an entry level early career employee, you know, you really should look at how do they treat their SDR team and what are the things that they have in motion? I think you just gave some very tactical advice, you know, how do they plan for vacation? Is, is their quota ramp for vacation? You know, those are very tactical things that I think now our folks can evaluate companies going forward using it. So appreciate the guidance there, Josh. Question number five. We ask all our folks on the podcast, both seasons, this question. I think it's a good opportunity to reflect. But if you could go back in time, now that you have the benefit of hindsight, what advice would you give yourself as you were entering into your career? Yeah, I think not every job is the right fit for you. Um, You need to evaluate all companies that you're interviewing with just like they're evaluating you. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, there have been companies that, uh, you know, you hear this all the time from SDRs and, and AEs, you know, oh, this is what I was told in the interview process. And it, it didn't, it didn't translate, right? It, it wasn't real. Um, and I think that the, the motto that actually Aaron uh, at Walk Me taught me is trust, but verify, right? You're going to be sold plenty of opportunities and plenty of things from plenty of people. It's fine to trust them and give them the benefit of the doubt, but you have to verify. Um, and I think in, in some of my earlier um, career, I think that it, it would have been a really good lesson for me to verify a lot of the information that I got because you, know, you can't look back and say that's their fault. You know, they weren't honest with me or they didn't do this. They didn't do that. Like, no, it's, it's not real. That might've been the case. That might be true, but Ultimately, it's still on you. It's still my fault that I didn't do the right evaluation. I didn't ask the right questions. And most importantly, that I just trusted people at their word instead of verifying the information. And, you know, I think that's the one thing that I I would go back and, um, you know, hopefully teach to my younger self, which is, you know, it's fine to trust, but you got to verify. Yep. I think that's totally right. And a lot of folks don't even know that in an interview process, it is as important that you're screening the employer. Uh, as it is for them screening you, which is obviously kind of the power positioning in an interview is is very different. I don't know if you're a, a, a curb your enthusiasm fan, but it's you know it's it's like flip that on them, right? So like you you have the uh, you have the ability to to flip the interview script and actually ask those employers or the folks that you may be working for in the future some targeted questions to make sure that they're the right fit for you. Questions like. How is the team doing, you know, against quota? What kind of benefits do you have in place for folks like me that are going to be working their butt off, you know, making tons of dials? You know, who's who's my manager? How are they how are they perceived, uh, you know, amongst the group? Like those are questions. Those are hard questions. Hard to ask, too. Not always thought through um, as you're going through an interview, but stuff that you need to pay attention to as you're evaluating employers for sure. And I think, Josh, there's a, another great point you brought up on on kind of making sure that you, you've got all your ducks in a row and are checking all the boxes before you jump into an employer. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Well, uh, appreciate your time, Josh. This has been really insightful for our crew. Um, where can folks find you? Yeah, um, feel free to find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I've, I've, I'm in a, a little uh, kind of white gray uh, button down Josh Roth uh, you'll you'll see my uh, my profile you'll see the uh, University of Oregon O you'll see uh, you'll see lob um, so feel free to check me out I uh, I have a personal um, uh, personal requirement for myself that I respond to every single LinkedIn message I get even if it's a sales uh, pitch that I just say no thank you to um, so feel free to, to, to shoot me a, a message there looking forward to connecting and engaging Awesome. So hit him on LinkedIn. He will respond, which is great. Uh, I, I can't promise you that uh, you won't be flooded with thousands of, of, of excited, eager future salespeople. Uh, but it sounds like Josh is open to it and, and willing to help, which is which is really awesome of, his, of him and his time. For audience, uh, soak this one up. Josh has been very strategic and tactical with his guidance. We loved having him on the show. So thank you again, Josh. And we hope to have you back someday on the Ramp Podcast and How I Sell. Awesome. Danny, thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. All right. Talk soon. Bye.